I have a message that I want to preach this morning because I want it on video. January the 11th, 2009, when I was coming down here only visiting at the time, I preached this sermon, but it wasn't videoed. And I think it's too important not to have a copy of it. So therefore, you're getting a rerun. I don't do many of those, but every once in a while I think that was a, that was a good sermon. I wish I had a copy of that. This is a sermon about Mr. Law and Mr. Love. It deals with the subject of law and grace. What it means to be under the law what it means to be under grace. What it means to be crucified with Christ. What it means to be dead to the law. It explains even some things about marriage, love, divorce, all kinds of things. Lordship salvation, turning from your sins, all that in just one message. But I need help in order to do this. So what I'm going to do, first of all, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians and chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And look there in verse 16. Verse 16. This is on page 1243 in one of the church Bibles. Verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That verse sounds to be pretty clear, very simple. The law cannot save you. Boiling it down means you cannot earn eternal life. You cannot work your way to heaven. Look there in verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. That's interesting. I wonder what it means. Verse 20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Take your Bible and turn all the way over there to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. And chapter 6. The book of Romans, you'll find it talks an awful lot about the body and the death of the body. So a lot of death in the book of Romans chapter 6. Chapter 8 talks an awful lot about life. But it's spiritual life. So somewhere between death and life hangs this one chapter that is filled with all kinds of little nuggets in it called chapter 7. Where we have the greatest conflict of all time. The one that goes on inside of us. I want you to just look in chapter 6 of the book of Romans and look what he says in verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Why do Christians sin? Why should we sin? What causes us to sin? So if we look in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? Because you see, the more sins I do, the more grace covers my sins. 
grace greater than my sins. So the more sins I commit, the more grace I receive. Isn't that wonderful? But shall I live in sin? How do we explain all of this? Sometimes it gets very, very confusing. Very confusing. Now in chapter 7, where it talks about the law, it will mention the law about 20 times. But the words I and me and my and mine, about 40 times. So it's about a man in the body, in the flesh, trying to please God. Sounds like an impossibility. Oh, well, it is. Now, there's a simple illustration that God gives here in His Word. And if you'll notice there in chapter 7 and verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Well, how long is a man going to live? Now, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. In the Old Testament, God did a miraculous thing. He brought a nation into being. He told Abraham, says, you're going to have a miraculous son. Name's going to be Isaac, and he's going to be a miracle child, a faith child. Because you and Sarah already passed the age of bearing children. But what God was going to do is intervene on their behalf, and they would have a child. From this child, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the twelve sons. Those twelve sons eventually were down in Egypt. And now they had grown to a couple million people. Four hundred years has passed. And now God was able and ready to take them out of that captivity, that slavery, bring them in to the Holy Land. But on the way, he had a meeting with them. God, see, wanted to do something special. God loved the nation of Israel. Loved the nation of Israel. So I'm going to have the nation of Israel come up here at this time. Rachel, would you come over here and sit right here in the center? All she's going to do is just sit here and look pretty. She doesn't have to say anything. She doesn't have to do anything. She represents the nation of Israel. And her name, for the sake of the illustration, is not Rachel. Her name is different. Her name is Miss I'm a good enough. I'm a good enough. You see, she thinks she's pretty good. I mean, she's not that bad. She lives a pretty good life. Minds her own business. But as you know and as I know, every young girl is looking for that perfect husband. She wants to get married. They may deny it, but you and I know the truth. This young girl is looking for the perfect husband. So we're going to get her the perfect husband. Uh, Jesse, come up here and sit over here on this side over here. Right? Just, just sit right there. Now, Jesse doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to do anything. He just, uh, he represents the perfect husband. And you and I know that when that little woman that we married, they knew they were getting a good deal. They knew they were getting that perfect husband. I mean, that's what they've been looking for all their life. And lo and behold, here we are. But it doesn't take long before we finally understand, and they understand, that there's something wrong. Conflicts begin to brew. Confrontation. Everybody doesn't see eye to eye. So in the book of Deuteronomy, and it makes the statement that um, God told Moses on Mount Sinai, I... I'm going to give you 
my law. If you will keep my law and obey my law, I will bless you. And Israel said, All that he hath required of me, I will do. So over here we have Mr. Law. This is Mr. Law. Mr. Law is perfect. Mr. Law is just. Mr. Law is righteous. Mr. Law does no wrong. Mr. Law is spiritual. You say, how do you know all of that? Because I made it up. No. I want you to look there in your Bible to the book of Romans in chapter 7. And look what he says here in verse 12. <coughs> verse 12. It says, wherefore, Mr. Law is holy. And Mr. Law is just. Mr. Law is good. Look in verse 14. For we know that Mr. Law is spiritual. So look up here. We can tell right off the bat there's nothing wrong with Mr. Law. He has no faults, no flaws. If anything, he is perfect. So now, Mr. Law... The Bible says, was joined together by the nation of Israel. And Israel says, all that is required of us by Mr. Law, we will do. So God gave the law, and God heard the words, I do. I do, I do a marriage. And Israel became the wife of Jehovah. But know this. God gave his law, which was a perfect standard of righteousness. Now you take Mrs. Alright here. She thinks she's alright. She's pretty good. Good enough. She says, whatever is required, I will do it. Isn't that what most women promise when they get married? And then somewhere along the line, now we'll get into a lot of deep stuff here this morning, but the doors are locked and you can't leave. But I want you to understand, Mr. Law says to his new wife, this is what I want you to do. I want you to cut the grass, wash the dishes, Clean the house. He gives her about ten things that he wants her to do. So he goes to work. He comes back and Mrs. Alrighta thought that what she had done was good enough. Why? He began to examine her works. And lo and behold, the grass wasn't cut just right. There were still spots on the dishes. There was a wrinkle in the bed. There was still dust on the windowsill. And everywhere he looked, he finds that she did not do everything he demanded. It didn't matter what she did that was right, is that he always found fault with her. She says, I'll try harder. I'll do my best. And it didn't matter how hard she tried. She got more frustrated. She became so in despair. She wondered, what can I do to ever please Mr. Law? Now understand, the problem was not with Mr. Law. Because he was just and good and righteous and holy and spiritual. I wonder where the problem is. The problem is, is that she was not good enough. She was not all right. She thought she was. But just by the fact of the law, she saw how far short she fell. Now, she goes to Mr. Law and she says, Oh, Mr. Law, would you just forgive me? And Mr. Law says, no, I don't forgive. 
All I want is a little love. I'm law. I don't give love. I'm law. What about a little mercy? I don't have mercy. I'm law. Just a little bit of grace? No grace. Law. Well, what are you going to do to me about all of this? Well, the soul that sinneth shall die. Now, she doesn't want to die. Now she's beginning to try to figure out, how can I get out of this marriage? I would do anything to get free from this man. So she knows the law. She knows what he requires. And look what he says here in the book of Romans in chapter 7. Verse 2. For the woman, which hath a husband, is bound by Mr. Law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Ha! There's the answer. All she has to do is wait for him to die. Isn't that what a lot of women are doing? <laughs> Waiting for him to die. And as some say, the sooner the better. When I became 70 years old, my wife lost $100,000 insurance. And she keeps thinking in her mind, what could have been? <laughs> just joking. Just joking. So over here, we have the answer to the solution. You see, they are married until separated by death. Death. It's the only way she can never get free. So now she knows she has sinned against the law. She is condemned. She's not good enough. And she has to die. So when you think about it, and as you study the scriptures, you'll see over and over again the scriptures talking about being free from the law. Being free from the lust and the desires of sin. To be free from death. What can I do to be free of all of this? What can this woman do to be free? Wait till he dies. But there's a problem. The wages of sin is death. He's perfect. If he's perfect, he doesn't sin. If he doesn't sin, he doesn't die. Oh, this is a dark day in her life. Now she really begins to understand just how trapped she is. It doesn't matter if she was to this day forward try to not do anything wrong. She's still guilty for the ones she's broke. For the laws she's already broke. For transgression she overstepped the boundary. She is guilty and condemned and she must die. Now, there's nothing wrong with Mr. Law. God gave the law. God brought them together. And this was to be the perfect marriage. She always wanted a perfect husband. Now she got him. Now she don't want him. Well, ain't that, don't, don't sound familiar? So now what are we going to do here? You see... It doesn't matter if she says, I am going to turn from all of my sins. If she was to try to stop, stop all of her sinning, does that solve her problems? No. doesn't solve her problems. Well, some people say, well, she needs to commit herself to Christ. Well, she can't. Why? She's married to this man. She cannot commit her life to any other man. As long as she is still married to this man. So how can she get free of this man? She has to die. And there is only one solution. 
Now, I, I want you to totally understand the complexity of the situation. If you understand anything that I'm saying here, and I hope that you do, let's just pretend that you are sitting right here. And you understand that according to the Word of God, the law of God, you have sinned against God. The law, you have broken the law. You have violated God's standard of righteousness. And you, you cannot save yourself. You can't deliver yourself. She can't do anything to get out of this situation. It is totally impossible. Her only way out of this is by death and death alone. So how can she be free? She doesn't want to die. Well, we need an answer for this terrible, terrible solution. So I'm going to ask Mr. Love over there to come up here and sit over here on this side. You know, these triangles really get complicated. You know, when there's another man in the story or another woman, it really can get ugly. But you see, Mr. Love over here, he has always, always Love Mrs. Center here. See, she thought she was all right. She thought she was good enough. Till Mr. Law came along and she found out now she is Mrs. Center. And she's not that good. Sorry, Rachel. Now, her only way out of this situation is that she must die. Because only by the death can there ever be the separation. That's why when a man and a woman gets married, that's why God says, until death do they part. And what God hath joined together, let no man, no man, put it asunder. It's not debate. But because of sin and the hardness of people's heart, it happens. Now, that's another sermon for another time. Right now we've got to get her out of this mess. Over here is Mr. Love. Mr. Love has always loved her and would have taken her at any time. But no, 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 no. She had to go after Mr. Law. She thought that he was so much better looking. And she thought that, you know, he's so perfect and so good. And so she just didn't know Mr. Love. She really didn't understand how wonderful he is. That's about the way it is. They're always looking someplace else and think the grass is greener on the other side. So Mr. Mr. Love has always cared, always loved her. But now, see, he can have her because she, she's, she's married to this man. Isn't this getting to be a sticky situation? So what... What can be done? So what Mr. Love did, he was born into the world under the dominion of the law. Because the only way he could deliver her from the curse of the law is he would have to be made of a woman under the law so that he has dominion over him. So he did not come to destroy the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. So there was a time and a place when Mr. Love was born into the world. And when he was born into the world, he was under the law. And he had to obey the law. And whatever the law demanded, he had to keep it perfectly. So by his righteous life, he never at one time ever violated any of the laws of Mr. Law. So then Mr. Law has no right to condemn him to death because there was no fault found in him. He was not guilty of any sin. So he didn't sin. So if he didn't sin, he doesn't have to what? He doesn't have to die. 
So therefore, because of his love for Mrs. Sinner, he was willing to take her place under the law. He would have to die in her place. So what he did is he was willing to go to the cross and die for the sins of the whole world. Because, you see, they have no hope, no choice. There's nothing they have to do to tell this girl, you have to turn from your sins in order to be saved, is an impossibility. Can't be done. She can't change herself. She can't change her nature. It's the way she was born. And to try to tell this girl, what you need to do is commit your life to Mr. Love over here and promise that you'll love and obey and all that. She can't commit herself to another man because she's still married to this man. Can't you understand that? Isn't that clear? That's why preachers who try to tell a lost man to turn from your sin to be saved, it's impossible. It's a shame and a disgrace. Or to tell people they have to commit their life to Christ, she doesn't have a life to commit to Christ. She's under the sentence of death. She's going to die. So what Mr. Love does, he goes to the cross and pays for her sin. And if she, according to the law, if she will accept that payment that he made for her, that death payment is put to her account, and whenever that payment is put to her account, Mr. Law can no longer touch her. Why? Because she paid her debt in full. Mr. Law can't condemn a dead person. That's why in Galatians in chapter 2, we are dead to the law. So when I accept that payment Christ made for me, I am now free from these three things. I am free from Mr. Law. The law can never touch me again, never condemn me again. I am not under the condemnation of the law. And I am free from my old sinful nature through death. And I don't have to ever fear death again. So I'm free from the law, sin, and death. And as you read the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, you will see what it's talking about. But try to keep this here in your mind. Now, even though he paid for the sins of the whole world, that payment is not put to their account until they individually, personally, believe he did it for them. So when you believe that he did it for you, that death payment he made is put to your account and as far as the law is concerned, you died and paid for all of your sins. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So let's just pretend now. Here sits. That's Mrs. Sinner. She understands that Mr. Love over here died and paid her penalty in full. That there's nothing that she has to do. Nothing she has to promise. She don't owe him anything. She don't have to make a commitment to him on anything. Because you see, she's still married. She is married until she's dead. So that day, that moment... That you and I trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. His death was put to my death. So when I died, Mr. Law can't never touch me again. And when I was buried and came back again from the dead, 
I was born again. I got my new life when I came back from the dead. Well, wh wh when did all that happen? You see, when Christ did that for you, and when you believed it, His death was put to your account. That's when you died. That day you believed it. You were buried with Christ. You were raised with Christ. And when you came back again from the dead, remember Christ was alive, He was buried, and came back from the dead. He arose again. It doesn't mean He did it twice. It was He was alive, He died, and lives again. I was alive. I died. And now I'm alive again. But my new birth that I got when I came back from the dead, I came without my sinful nature. God gave me my new birth. Now I'm born of God. So let's just look here now. We have Mrs. Sinner. She understands and believes that what he did was for her. She says, I will accept that pardon. I will accept that payment as my payment. When she believes it, she is free from the law. Her debt is paid. Now, he's done it for everybody in the world, but the payment's not put to everybody's account until they believe that he did it for them. Isn't that on a level that anybody can have? Would you, just, would you believe that he did it for you? It's a gift. It's free. You don't earn it. You don't commit. You don't stop. You don't promise. You don't pledge. You don't do anything except receive the free gift of eternal life. So now Mrs. Sinner is now Mrs. Saint. Now, she looks the same. But see, she's gone from all these different things. And now she is Mrs. Saint. Not Bernard. Saint. So now because she is a saint of God. You see, she did not have to promise or pledge or stop or do anything like that. You see, she had to have a new birth. Now that she, as a child of God, has been given a new birth, spiritual birth, born of God, See, you and I know, I really didn't die. I really wasn't buried. I really didn't come back from the dead. But I am to reckon this so. Look there in your Bible to the book of Romans in chapter 6. You'll notice that in verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing, in verse 9, that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he dieth, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. You are supposed to live like it really happened to you. But it's a spiritual birth. It didn't really literally happen to you in the flesh. So when you trusted Christ as your Savior, this is what happened to you. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was put to your account. Not just his death. You see, you were crucified with Christ. You were raised with Christ. You ascended with Christ and are seated in the heavenlies in Christ. Now as a child of God, she finds herself in a new situation. Here's the guy that gave his life so that she could be free from the law of sin and death. She's at liberty to do whatever she wants to do. She's not bound by the law of Moses or the law of Christ. She's free. You mean she can trust Christ as Savior and have eternal life and live any way she wants? Yes, she certainly can. Well, that don't sound right. It may not sound right, but that's the way it is. So wh wh what are we going to do? Well, Mr. Love makes a plea to her. He says this, 
you know, you're, you're free from Mr. Law because you died. He says, if you will present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable under Mr. Love. He says, and you can know the perfect will of God by the renewing of your mind. And I will bless you. And you will be happy and peace and joy. All the things you want in life. And she says, I do, I do, I do. Now, not many women get married twice in one morning service. So now she is free to commit her life to Christ. You see, she couldn't do it till she was free from him. So that's why committing your life to Christ cannot be done until after you're saved. Because, you see, you have to die in order to be free. Now that she is free from Mr. Law over here, she's free to commit herself to another man. Now, he says, this is what I want you to do. I, I want you to cut the grass. And I want you to wash the dishes, clean the house. He gave her all kinds of things to do. She thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've heard this before. I've heard this before. And her heart just drops. She, she, you mean I've still got to do all of those things? He said, no, no, no wait, wait a minute. Not too fast. He says, I am going to give to you the Holy Spirit. He's just like me. He's perfect. He's God. He's good. And I'm going to have him live inside of you. And he is going to help you do everything that I want you to do with your life. Oh, so all you have to do is just let him lead you, let him guide you, and he will direct you. Do you understand? Yeah. <clears throat> and when you fail, when you don't live up to everything that I want you to do, I, I want you to come to me. Because you see, I will forgive you. I have mercy. I have grace. I, I have forgiveness. Everything that you want, everything that you need, I can take care of that for you. And I also promise you this. I will never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. So you see, in your new birth, you are as perfect and as righteous as Christ. But in our lives that we live here on the earth, I still have this old sinful body. And I still have no sinful nature. And I still fail, just like everybody does. But I know when I fail the Lord, I know that my wonderful, loving, heavenly Father will never cast me out and never lose me. The other thing to keep in mind is this. He can't ever unborn her. He can't never cast her away. He can't never lose her. Why? Because you see, in Christ, she is perfect. You see, all of her sins, they've all been paid. There is no sin to condemn her. She is free from the law. The law cannot bring up all that dirt anymore. She's free free. Give them a big hand. I want to share. Y'all can sit down now. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans in chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. 
And notice what he says here. <coughs> this illustration is right here in the book of Romans. You see in verse 2, For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. See, that illustration is right here in the Word of God. It's just that I just used the woman. And so when she dies, she's now free from the law. And by Christ giving her life, she is now free to commit herself to the Lord. You see, I did not have to commit my life to the Lord in order to be saved. Because then that means that you're committing yourself to have to live a certain way in order to be a Christian. And then if you don't live up to this wonderful life because you don't have the power to do it, you're going to fail and you're going to be very frustrated. And there is no salvation to anyone who believes that they're saved because they stopped certain sins, or because they started living a certain way. How you live your life has nothing to do with being justified by faith. I'm a sinner. I ought to go to hell. But the Lord loved me. He sent His Son, Mr. Love, into the world and down the cross, paid for my sins, and said, if I believed He did it for me, he would put that payment he made to my account, and I get to go to heaven on what he did. Who gets the credit for my salvation? The Lord. I do not and cannot claim my salvation on any merits that I've ever done or ever will do. Look what else he says. In verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, <coughs> ye also are become dead to Mr. Law, by the body of Mr. Love, that ye should be married to another, even to him, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So we now see, just like when a man and a woman get married and they have children, that's the fruit of their marriage. When you and I trusted Christ as our Savior, we are, in a sense, we're married to Christ. Someday the wedding is going to take place. Right now I'm just the bride. But the Bible talks about us having the fruits of righteousness. We can produce the fruit of righteousness that we could not do under the law. See, the law was given to control the restraints of a man's old sinful nature of his flesh birth. A perfect man doesn't need law. The reason we have so many more laws being passed in our country is because we're sinful and increasing in wickedness. And so they pass more laws to control or to restrain us. And that's how we lose our liberty. Every time Congress meets... You're losing liberty. I think they need to take a vacation for about a hundred years. But now, here in Romans in chapter 7, I want you to see this. He says in verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. In other words, I'm not under the law. I'm not under the Ten Commandments. But you see, the righteousness of the law, there was nothing wrong with it. The problem with the law was me. I couldn't fulfill it. So God says that the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in us, but not by us, but because of Him. So in the book of Romans in chapter 8, you have about the Holy Spirit that lives within you to help you live the life that you're supposed to live. See, the Christian life is not something you manufacture. 
The Christian life is a spiritual life. It's lived by Him through you. All you have to do in Romans chapter 6 is yield to Him. Yield. Will you yield your will to the Lord? And do whatever God wants you to do. Remember this. One of the reasons that I want to serve the Lord is not because of what I want from God. I know He's going to bless my life. I know that He's going to reward me when I get to heaven. But I serve the Lord not because of what He's going to do, but because of what He hath done. He died for me. Gave me eternal life. And in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 14, where it makes the statement that we are constrained and motivated to serve the Lord because of what He's done. His love for us. Because of all the wonderful things God's done for us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them. The love of Christ, the love of Christ, constrained and motivates us. Because of what he did for me, that's why I want to serve the Lord. I don't serve the Lord because I have to. Because I'm under some law that says I have to. But did you know the law of Christ is the law of love? And love will cause you to do things the law couldn't make you do. It was just a standard of perfection and righteousness. This deals with a heart and the motive of why a man does what he does. I can't make anyone love God. But I know this. Love is a very powerful motivating force. When Jesus Christ was here in the book of John 14, 31, he made the statement that the world may know that I love my Father, even so I do. In other words, I do what I do because I love my Father. I want the world to know, and even all Christians to know, I do what I do because I love my Father, because of what He's done on the cross for me. He has set me free. I am no longer under the law. I don't have to fear death. In my old sinful nature, I have within me the indwelling Holy Spirit to help me to live the way that God wants me to live. And one day, when I literally lose this old body, I'll lose that old sinful nature. And I'll be free from it for all eternity. But it is as good as done. Because I've got the Word of God on that. Now, in chapter 7, I want you to see something very quickly before we close. Look there in verse 15. <coughs> because as a child of God, you are going to struggle in your Christian life. In verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Isn't that clear? Is that clear that is? It means that now that you can serve the Lord, you still have that old sinful body with that old sinful nature within you and you're going to have a clash because you're going to want to serve the Lord and then sometimes you want to put yourself back into the flesh and live like a lost man and fall in love with the things of the world and the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and that's what you want because you see you're still dragging this old dead man around with you one day it'll all be over but until then, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. How to perform that which is good, I find. How do I perform? How do I live the way God wants me to live? And that's why he says 
in chapter 8 by the Holy Spirit. See, God did not leave you alone. He didn't just save you and forsake you. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And so you and I have the power that raised up Jesus from the dead living inside of our mortal bodies. We are the children of God. Best news in all the world. Look up there. This hand represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. We all have sin upon us. God loves us. He hates our sin, but he loves us. You see, we all thought we was all right, that we were good enough, until the law says that thou shalt not, and we did. And we broken God's law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Well, we blew that, didn't we? Thou shalt not covet. Well, we messed up there. Thou shalt not lie. Well, I never did that. That was a lie. God said, let God be true and every man a liar. We've all sinned against God. And God says, the wages of sin is death. So that's why we all have to die. We're all condemned because we're all under the law. And God says, no man can save himself. You cannot deliver yourself. There's nothing you can do. How you live will never change this fact. Going to church ain't going to help you. Giving money, not going to help you one iota. Changing your life in every way is not going to help you. You're going to die and spend an eternity in hell. Unless you do the only one thing you can do. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord. God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us. Hates our sin. Because our sin separates us from God. You see Jesus Christ? Yeah, he's perfect. Because he's perfect, he didn't sin. Uh, because he didn't sin, he didn't have to die. Oh, we do. So he was made under the law, made of a woman, and took all the sins upon himself and paid for all the sins so that anybody, if they would just believe he did it for them, he would put that payment that he made to their account and they'd get to go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for them. I have trusted Christ as my Savior. I believe he did this for me. Do you believe he did it for you. If you will, God will save you. You'll become his child, and you'll get to go to heaven whenever you die. See, the Bible says we're not under the law. Now, he says, you're under grace. Grace means that you're under Christ. Christ is grace. And because you're under grace means that you got here, not because of any work that you did but because of what he did for you. So since your works didn't put you there, your bad deeds can't take you out from under grace. I oh, love it. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed. And no one looking around. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you may have heard all about this from all different kind of viewpoints. But I pray that you understand what I've said today. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, friend, you're lost. There is no possibilities. There's no hope. It's only in Christ. Would you right now, in the quietness of this moment, just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I believe Christ died for me. And I will trust him as my only hope of going to heaven. And friend, God said if you would trust him, he would save you. You become his child. That payment he made is just like you made it. He puts it to your account. The law is satisfied. And you won't have to go to hell and pay for one sin. God loves you that much. Would you believe he did it for you? If you will, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I just want to have prayer for you. So if what I've said made sense to you and you say, Preacher, that made sense to me and I will trust Christ as my Savior. And I'd like you to pray for me. Would you slip in it real quickly and put it right back down? Then we're all. You know, I'll just slip it up real quick and put it right back down. Our Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. We thank you for the privilege of preaching your word. And Father, we know that I have to give account someday for the things that I've said. And I pray, Lord, that there's wisdom in this message and people would hear it and understand it and realize the importance of what Christ did for us and to serve him, not because we have to but because we want to. 